fantastic. Thank you so much, Linda. That was a really very kind introduction. And um, oh, I hope that you'll watch this again because this is such a you know a fun thing. So I love spinal fluid, as is probably clear from either my reputation or just my raw enthusiasm for the topic. So um, what we're going to talk about today is um, how to collect CSF and what to do with uh, the spinal fluid once you get it. So, um, you know, part of our, our job as, um, as neurologists and, um, and people who care for patients with neurologic disease is um, to deal with a lot of these complications of cancer. Um, and the, the usual kind of complications of, of cancer, the neurologic complications of cancer include stroke, seizure, infection, an ICP crisis, and metastasis. Um, and CSF interpretation is actually very important for the diagnosis of these last three, um, infection, ICP crisis, and metastasis. So it's really part and parcel of just good neurologic care um, for cancer patients. Um, so spinal fluid, when we're collecting spinal fluid or cerebrospinal fluid or CSF, and I, I tend to use those terms interchangeably, CSF is really sampling within the leptomeningeal space. So what is the leptomeningeal space? So the leptomeninges are the, the soft coverings of the brain and the spinal cord, um, and they surround the entire central nervous system. Uh, the leptomeninges consist of the pia, this green line. Oh, wait, here, let me see if I can use this thing. Um, laser pointer. Ah, here we go. So this green line um, is the pia, the arachnoid, these stringy bits, and it contains the circulating cerebral spinal fluid. So um, spinal fluid itself is generated by the choroid plexi. And the choroid plexi um, reside in the ventricular system. There are these guys here. I have to say this is a fixed brain. And so it looks like a whole lot of nothing here. And you just, you think, how could you fall in love with that structure? But if you see it, you know, freshly dissected from um, a brain. It's really very pretty. Um, they sort of look like kind of sheets of algae in the ocean or if you're feeling poetic, but anyway. So the choroid plexi generate spinal fluid um, and the spinal fluid that they generate um, fills the ventricles and then circulates throughout the ventricular system, um, coating the, um, filling the leptomeningeal space, supporting the brain and the spinal cord, and then serving as a sink for all kinds of processes, okay? So how do we collect and sample spinal fluid? So there are a bunch of different ways to do it, and we're gonna go over them, but so the first question is sort of where might you do this? So there are two different ways to do a, a lumbar puncture. Um, a bedside lumbar puncture is usually the fastest and the easiest, and I'm a big fan. Um, a fluoroscopic um, lura, lumbar puncture usually doesn't give an accurate opening pressure. So I say, go for the bedside if you can. Also, when you wanna know the answer, you just wanna know the answer and you don't wanna call somebody to make a test. Um, so when should you do it? So um, it's easiest to do after MRI, but it's really not essential for that. Um, sometimes you'll hear on rounds that someone might say, well, if we do the lumbar puncture before the MRI, we might see enhancement due to the lumbar puncture. So the enhancement that you see after a lumbar puncture is enhancement of the pachymeninges, which are the dura, um, and not the leptomeninges, which is what we're concerned about. So um, any neuroradiologist worth his salt can tell the difference, and any neurologist worth their salt can too. So really, if, if you need to get lumbar spinal fluid, you need to get lumbar puncture, and don't get bogged down in details. During the week, it's easy to sample spinal fluid at any time because there's the systems are in place to process what you get. Um, on the weekend, it's a great time to collect for symptomatic relief, but some of those tests that we're gonna talk about later in the lecture just don't really happen as easily. What are we sending? Well, that's like the meat of this talk, right? So you're gonna be sending tests like cytology, circulating tumor markers, antibody tests, and other research tests. Um, and then there's always this, are we sampling again? Do we need to do it again? The answer is, if someone's asking, usually it's yes. But um, the issue is, is if you're looking for cancer cells and this uh, CSF is negative, um, you can repeat it in about two weeks. And if it's negative, you could repeat again in two weeks. Sometimes we do a cisternal tap or tap a different side of the spine if we're just not satisfied with our results. So in terms of the risks, um, I always think, what are you worried about? because you have to convince yourself that this is a, a reasonable test to do and is safe to do. And then also, what is the patient worried about? Um, very often, they are completely different topics. 
Um, usually what, what we're worried about is our ability to do the test. <laughs> um, we're worried about causing the patient pain um, and we're worried about getting it all done in our, uh, our day that is filled with tasks. We got our little checklist to get through. Um, and you know, sometimes you just start worried about that. What the patients tend to be worried about, they tend to be worried about um, complications from a lumbar puncture and they worry that the lumbar puncture is gonna be rip roaringly painful. Um, we're not gonna talk about this right now, but I'll just in brief, um, just to remind you that a lumbar puncture because of neuroanatomy is not going to cause, doesn't have a risk of causing um, paralysis because of course the cord ends uh, far north of where we're actually um, collecting spinal fluid. Um, lumbar punctures um, are largely not painful as long as we use appropriate analgesia and good uh, positioning of the patient. So um, why are we sampling CSF? There are two, two main reasons for doing a, a lumbar puncture for collecting spinal fluid. One is to investigate symptoms. This is a therapeutic uh, lumbar puncture. And the other is to identify syndromes, a diagnostic lumbar puncture. So some of the symptoms that you can investigate with a lumbar puncture are, are headache, um, positional symptoms or pressure waves, um, if we wanna measure the ICP. Um, and then for all of these kind of therapeutic taps, you need to examine the patient after the lumbar puncture, right? So in all of these cases, you're assuming or sort of hypothesizing that the patient's symptoms are due to problems with spinal fluid flow, right? So then you take off some spinal fluid, you, you know, alter the system, and then the key is to check your work afterwards, right? You need to see what happened now that I did this test. Is the patient better? Can they walk? Is their headache better? Um, do those pressure waves, do they go away? Um, so this is sort of in a therapeutic tap, you always need to do a post LP exam. For a diagnostic lumbar puncture, what we're really concerned about is we're looking at, you know, invasion of a tumor or metastasis into the space. We're looking at autoimmune processes. We're looking for infections. And for a diagnostic lumbar puncture, you're going to be sending a lot of tests. Okay. So both of them have kind of downsides. One of them, the therapeutic one, you have to examine post LP, the diagnostic lumbar puncture, you got to send a lot of tests. It's a lot of paperwork. Okay. So let's take them step ways. Okay. So let's start with a therapeutic uh, lumbar puncture. So ICP elevation is one of the main reasons that you might be considering doing a, a therapeutic lumbar puncture. So what are the symptoms and signs of ICP elevation? So the symptoms include headache, diplopia, and nausea. And all of these symptoms might be positional, meaning um, a patient may complain of a headache that is worse when they're lying down than when they're sitting up, um, double vision that might be worse when flat when sitting up, or nausea in the same position. Um, because of, of pressure waves and some paradoxical effects, it's entirely possible that these, head, that these symptoms might be reversed, where they may have a headache when they're standing up and not when they're laying down, and diplopia and nausea as well. So just take note of any positional component of your symptoms. Signs or, or things that we're going to uh, observe on exam include a disconjugate gaze, so that the eyes not moving together in the sixth and fourth. Um, blurred vision on the extremes of lateral gaze. So even though it may appear that the eyes are moving together, it may be with a, a, a subtle cranial neuropathy that a patient might say, well, you know what, it's actually blur. I'll follow your finger. And it's a little bit blurrier when I get to the to kind of over, all the way over here. And then it's, it clears up and then it gets blurry again. That's a sign of a really, of a subtle uh, cranial neuropathy um, on the sixth side. Um, in terms of, of the, the last uh, sign is papilledema. Um, and so papilledema um, really means um, edema in the, in the back of the eye. So um, in order to be able to recognize papilledema, you need to look at a lot of eyes. So you need to become really comfortable with your ophthalmoscope. And the only way to become comfortable is to just um, irritate a lot of patients by shining a light in their eye. Um, so these are photographs taken, um, these are retinal photographs, and they're sort of what you would see with a panoptic um, ophthalmoscope. Um, the ophthalmoscopes that we have at the bedside tend to be um, the direct ophthalmoscope. So you're going to be seeing, so I'm going to draw with my, my pointer here. This is sort of what you're able to see with an op of direct ophthalmoscope. You sort of see about one kind of edge of the disc. So you sort of do this with your scope. You're sort of like looking around the edges here to check out all of the edges of the scope. 
or of the optic disc. It doesn't take too long at all. And once you're used to seeing this edge, you find the edge and you sort of track it around and you're good. So same deal here. So which patient has papilledema in this? Patient A or patient B? Does anyone have a, a thought? I can hear you saying loud and clear that it is um, B and it's true. Um, B is papilledema. And how we know that is that the disc margins are blurred, right? So this is sharp and this is blurry. Um, and you can also see that these vessels that are coursing over the edges of the, uh, of the optic disc, can you see how they start to get lost there? That's a sign that that disc is raised so high that the vessels are, are stretched to the point where they can't, um, that blood can't go through them anymore in that spot. Okay, so this is, is classic kind of papilledema. Um, you don't need to have it be this bad for papilledema. You could have just one edge of the disc get blurry and that would still be called papilledema. So how do we measure an opening pressure? Because that's what you really need to do here. So to measure an opening pressure, you need to position the patient appropriately. So the lateral decubitus position is best, all right? You want the patient, of course, they're gonna be curled up. They're gonna have a nice straight spine parallel to the floor. Um, our beds can sometimes be squishy, so you're going to want to turn off any of the fanciness with the bed, or um, as if you're doing chest compressions, frankly, um, they have that button on the bed so that you can take out the air to do chest compressions. Um, I use that for lumbar puncture. Um, the patient will be curled up in the lateral decubitus position, but they need to, to relax their legs when you're measuring the pressure, meaning that they can still have their legs bent, but they, can't, they shouldn't have them all curled up tight on their chest. I and mean, you want them to take some deep breaths to try and relax um, because valsalvaing, so that kind of valsalva maneuvers where they're increasing their abdominal pressure, that can increase the intracranial pressure as well. So all of these things, a nice position, relaxed patient, you're gonna get an accurate um, opening pressure. So what is a normal opening pressure? So in an adult, a normal opening pressure is between 10 to 16 centimeters of water. A moderately high one, 17 to 20, and a high opening pressure is greater than 20 or out the top of the uh, manometer. <laughs> that is always the sign of a too high. So when somebody has an elevated intracranial pressure, what you want to do is tap them down to normal and then measure your closing pressure. So that's what this um, person is doing here. You can see here they've got the, uh, the little tube coming out of the manometer. So that allows this uh, person to drain the spinal fluid while measuring the pressure. So you can certainly drain the uh, spinal fluid while measuring the pressure, um, collecting tubes of fluid as you go, and then it's sort of a two for one. So what's wrong with this picture? Oh my gosh, what on earth is she doing? It's like, there's no PPE at all. Um, it looks like she just sort of walked in off the street and did this, it's crazy. So um, you are, far more precious than anything else in our entire hospital, right? So you are worth all, every piece of PPE, and so you should use it all. Um, so spinal fluid is infectious, um, and you can certainly catch um, illnesses from, uh, from spinal fluid taps, um, particularly from patients who have elevated intracranial pressure, and your eye is right down there as you're doing a tap. You must wear eye protection. You need a mask and a gown. Um, and sterile gloves at minimum, okay? Always uh, measure ICP in a cancer patient because they're always at risk for having elevated intracranial pressure. And if you're doing all the trouble to stab them in the back to get uh, spinal fluid, um, you know, it's two seconds to put the manometer on. Um, there are some instances where you just can't do it. I completely understand, but in an ideal world, please measure ICP. So what do we do when we see that somebody has elevated ICP urgently, okay? So it may be that the patient has elevated intracranial pressure and, um, and you're kind of wondering how to manage this. So number one, put the head of the bed up. I know this sounds like the least high-tech maneuver possible, but it turns out the number of times I've gone into a bed, you know, to see a patient who has got an ICP issue and they are flat on their back, crazy. So head of bed up. If they are unstable, meaning that they're unable to protect their airway because they're becoming drowsy, um, this is a patient that you're not gonna roll on their side and you're gonna do a, a, you know, a, a lumbar puncture, right? You need to manage them quickly. Um, so we're gonna give that patient mannitol, uh, a gram per kilogram as you're taking them to the CT scan. 
If they're not protecting their airway, then you need to intubate them and then man do everything else, okay? So just remember your ABCs, but don't get distracted by the brain. After your CT scan, if, there, if the patient has fresh blood, you want to reverse the cause of the, cause of the bleeding, um, give them mannitol a gram per kilogram now, and then hypertonic saline later. Nothing really squeezes the brain dry as fast as mannitol does. Um, and then you're going to follow with your osms and your sodium, right? If it's just tumor and no blood, you can give them mannitol initially, right? Because it's fast and this patient is unstable. Um, and then you can give them dexamethasone soon. And that one, two punch is going to help you reduce their ICP. If it's safe, then you can tap them. You can measure their ICP and tap them down. Okay. Um, patients that have elevated intracranial pressure very often have seizures and you need to manage those with benzodiazepines and antiepileptics. Um, so we use benzodiazepines first. And then of course, as I think we all know, we're going to load with either levetiracetam or phenytoin or, or um, valproate. And then you can consider intubating and midazolam drips if you still can't get ahead of those seizures. Um, in kind of the worst case scenario, you can reduce cerebral demand for these patients by using barbiturates uh, or putting them into a coma or cooling them. Um, this is like something I have literally never seen at Sloan Kettering, but definitely happens at other institutions. And I, I feel like I wanna give you the full range of possibilities here. And of course, um, you wanna consult a neurosurgeon because you're running out of space, right? This is an uh, ICP issue um, and you're running out of space. And so the neurosurgeons are great about giving us a little bit more space. Um, so for patients who have non-urgent um, elevations of ICP, meaning that um, they're in the hospital, they have elevated intracranial pressure, um, but they're awake, they're alert, they have maybe a cranial neuropathy that comes and goes, but they're not, you know, they're not busy coming in and out of consciousness, right? So for that patient, you want to do a neurosurgical consultation for a shunt placement. So um, shunts are great palliative care. They provide excellent symptomatic relief and they're really essential before we're doing any other therapies. So if you think about it, all of the other therapies that we're going to be doing for patients that have either leptomeningeal metastasis or a brain tumor, right? All of those therapies are going to lead to increased intracranial pressure, right? If we radiate, if we add um, almost any kind of chemotherapy, and then also if we're taking them to the OR, this patient's going to need a, a, you know, they're going to need a shunt. Okay. And all of this is because it is so much nicer on both the patient and you actually, um, to do a planned VP shunt, um, and then give the patient radiation than to do radiation and then have a patient come in, um, neurologically unstable who needs an urgent VP shunt. Nobody likes that. The surgeons, the patients, you, me. So if, if bad, it's better to, to plan. Okay, so now what about the, the kind of less common, or sorry, the kind of more common indication of a diagnostic lumbar puncture? Um, so for a diagnostic lumbar puncture, as I said before, what we're really worried about is direct invasion of tumor into that space. We're concerned about autoimmune processes and we're concerned about infections, right? So the first thing you're gonna do with your CSF testing um, are there basic tests? And these are the old school tests. And I know that at MSK, we're really into like the state of the art at all times, right? We're always doing the crazy new thing, but old school tests are actually really, really useful. Okay. So the basic tests are the, the first tests that come back are your glucose and your protein, right? So CSF glucose normal ranges from 45 to 80, and you can, it, it tracks along with the blood glucose. So Glucose in the CSF is usually about two thirds of the blood glucose. Regardless of whatever the blood glucose is, if your glucose in the CSF is less than 40, that's always abnormal, all right? Um, inflammatory processes generally lower the CSF glucose um, with the exception of a viral meningitis, which usually gives you a normal glucose. And why is this? This is because of impaired glucose transport in the choroid plexus. So all of this inflammatory signaling in the spinal fluid leads the choroid plexus to misfunction. It's not able to transport glucose appropriately and you end up with a low CSF glucose. So when you see that low glucose and low value in the CSS, or I think it's called hypoglycorrhagia or something, um, you can, uh, your differential diagnosis is pretty large, right? Includes bacterial meningitis, TB meningitis, fungal meningitis, um, sarcoid, um, but also lepto, which we see 
I love that I put amoebic meningitis in here because I saw it once at Sloan and I was like, yeah, amoebic. Um, but the important thing to know is that low CSF glucose, something is wrong, but it's sort of hard to say what exactly, which is why you get a, you get the other bonus, uh, gold school test right away, which is protein. So protein, uh, normal values in the CSF are between 15 and 45. And that's like the official value, but I mean, 40 is my number. I really expect to see it about 40 inflammatory processes generally increase the CSF protein. Um, but you want to make sure that you're looking at where the CSF was collected and the site of collection dictates what a normal value is. So I see normal is around 40 because I'm talking about a lumbar puncture. If we're collecting spinal fluid from, let's say, an Omaya port or a cisternal tap, we're going to expect a little bit lower level. And the reason for that is that CSF is generated in the ventricular system and as it circulates, it's going to be accumulating protein. Okay. So what is the CSF protein? Like what are these proteins? I'm glad you asked. Um, so uh, first it's mostly albumin and IgG, so aminoglobulins, but then there's a lot of other really cool stuff, um, including metabolic enzymes like aldolase and cholinesterases and dehydrogenases. There's also um, all of the enzymes that are needed to manage neurotransmitters, including dopamine beta hydroxylase. Um, there are a lot of transporters present. There's quite a lot of transferrin in the CSF um, and immune signaling. So you expect to see things like complements, cytokines and all of that. And then of course, there's always the dead cells, debris and kind of shrapnel of whatever it is that we just did to the patient, right? So the other kind of part of the, the basic test trifecta is the cell count. So whereas you're going to get your protein and your glucose levels, um, usually, as you probably all know, in the first hour after a spinal tap, the cell count is probably going to come at about an hour, hour and a half later. Um, on the, the cell count, um, we would expect to see less than four nucleated cells per millimeter. Okay, so this is where neurologists get all hot and bothered and we all have a lot of strong opinions. The official answer is, is that suspicious the number of cells that are like if we that uh, an elevated count between five and 10 is suspicious. It's certainly not normal, but it's hard to say that it's frankly abnormal. Um, an abnormal value is is greater than 10 and everyone agrees on that point. The issue is the clinical context here. So if you have a patient who has cancer um, and you see a cell count of about nine, that's not normal, right? It's it's not it's not abnormal, but it's certainly not normal. And in a larger context, if I saw an, a cell count of nine, and then I saw an elevated protein and a reduced glucose, but the cytology was normal, I'd think to myself, something is brewing here. I don't know what it is, but something's not quite right. And why is this? It's because normal spinal fluid is almost completely acellular, meaning that there's almost no cells within that space. An influx of immune cells into that space is almost always a sign of pathology. So um, in, this, in the case of, of leptomeningeal metastasis, the cancer cells are actually a minority of those cells, right? So it's 80% immune cells and just 20% cancer cells. So if you catch a lot of immune cells in that space, something's up, right? There's this question of uh, blood contamination that always comes up. Um, we don't tend to worry about this as much at Sloan Kettering compared to other hospitals. Part of it's because many of our patients have Omaya port, so it's not an issue. Um, but let's say you had a tab that looked a little pink, right? And you thought, ooh, how am I going to interpret this? No problem. You're just going to collect two tubes and do send a cell count on one tube at the start of your collection and one at the end. And then you send both of them for the cell count. And you can see if it starts to clear then that tells you that that was just a, what we call a traumatic tap, meaning that you probably hit a little vessel as you were um, introducing the needle into the space. Happens to the best of us. So in terms of the cell count, they're, ele the, they're labeled generally as a nucleated cell, meaning a non-erythrocyte, right? Um, when we see elevated lymphocytes, that's something that you see with all infections, autoimmunity, and malignancy. Very um, occasionally, you'll see elevated PMNs um, or neutrophils, and that's consistent with a bacterial infection in the space. Elevated macrophage count in the CSF is something that we associate like as a post-traumatic event, um, as the macrophage kind of come in and start to gobble up all the blood and shrapnel. 
Um, we also see that in malignancy and autoimmunity. And elevated EOs in the spinal fluid is associated with parasitic infections, viral infections, and sometimes malignancy. I, I read this paper and so I put it on here, which is all to say, you note that malignancy is kind of all of them except for PMNs. Cancer is always on your differential diagnosis. Okay, so your cell count and your um, cytol your cell count, your protein and your glucose came back, and that's giving you a bit of an idea of what's going on. If we look at our cell count, this is an example of a, a classic cell count um, from, from Sloan here. So we have, um, it tells you where you got your cells from. Um, it tells you this is from tube number three. So it's gonna be um, a clean, uh, not bloody, or not contaminated CSF collection. They're telling us it's, it's colorless and clear, which good on you. Um, and then we see nucleated cells of eight. Hmm, I don't love that. Um, because I want it to be a little bit lower. Red blood cell count, less than one, no problem. And then they counted 100 cells and they saw 26% lymphocytes, 65% monocytes and macrophage, and then 9% um, extrinsic cells. So what do I mean by extrinsic cells? That always comes up. So the person doing this body fluid cell count and differential um, is not a pathologist, right? They're um, somebody who is, is running the, the, cell, the, the cytology service, but they're not empowered to say this is cancer. An extrinsic cell says this is a cell that doesn't belong here. This is a cell that looks like, um, it, it looks a little bit like a cancer cell, or it could possibly be a choroid plexus epithelial cell, or it could be an ependymal cell but it's not a blood cell, okay? An extrinsic cell is just not a blood cell, but we're talking at about 9% extrinsic cells and other in a slightly elevated nucleated cell count that sort of gets my antennae up. Then of course the attending, so the, um, the physician that was looking at this said, nucleated cell differential is remarkable for the presence of malignant cells. So this guy is like, I'm empowered to say that this is a, a malignant cell. I think they look like malignant cells, but, would prefer that you correlate with cytology to, comp to confirm, okay? I feel like this is a really weird way of, of giving results to us, um, but it is consistent um, institution to institution. It really just reflects who's doing the work. So the, the person that's doing this work is a technician and this attending review is the person who says, looks like cancer to me. Okay, that was really long-winded. All right, so now let's get into more fun and exotic things like protein chemistries. Okay, so when we think that somebody might have an autoimmune or an inflammatory process, um, we're gonna be looking at um, antibodies in the spinal fluid, and these are immunoglobulins. So there are three different ways that we can measure immunoglobulins in the spinal fluid. One is called an IgG index. Sometimes we also send for quantitative immunoglobulins, and sometimes we send for oligoclonal bands. Don't worry, I'm gonna teach you about all of them. Okay, so we wanna know, is this, an is this elevated protein an immunoglobulin? And is this immunoglobulin in the CSF only or is it in both the blood and the CSF? And is the antibody against something in the central nervous system only? And then what kind of antibody is this? Okay, so if you wanna know, is this elevated protein an immunoglobulin or an antibody? No problem, you're gonna send an IgG index because an IgG index compares the blood and the CSF immunoglobulin levels. And you're gonna be able to correlate the two of them. And actually it's automatically done and it's reported as an IgG index. Okay, what if um, you wanna know if this is in the blood and the CSF and is this antibody against something in the central nervous system? So that is oligoclonal banding. And I'm gonna show you what those test results look like, but this is what oligoclonal banding looks like in the laboratory. So here we have, this is a, a, a protein blot um, of CSF and serum from four different patients. And these bands, right? So these little stripes of protein tell us about antibodies. And so you can see here in A, this person had more stripes in their serum and not, so, not any in their CSF. This person in B had CSF bands that were not present in the serum. And this person in C had the same problem. This person in D had some bands that were present in the CSF that were also present in the serum. Okay, so 
oligoclonal banding tells us there are bands, those bands are antibodies. Are they present in the spinal fluid or the serum or both? Okay, and we can identify individual antibodies, which is pretty cool, all right? The last test that you can send is something called quantitative immunoglobulins in the CSF in the blood. And this is where we ask the, uh, the laboratory to tell us exactly how much IgA, IgM, and IgG are present in the CSF and in the blood of these patients. And that allows us to say, look, there are antibodies and they're against something that's unique to the brain. And it, those antibodies are predominantly IgM or IgG or IgA or whatever. So an oligoclonal banding report looks like this. Um, and this is a pretty classic um, negative result that is sometimes misinterpreted by somebody who's reading as a positive result. So if you see here, it says oligoclonal bands, CSF and serum. And then it says CSF and serum, C note. And then it says oligoclonal bands noted, reference range, no bands. So then you're thinking that's positive. No, you need to keep reading. It says four identical gamma restriction bands are observed in CSF and serum. Okay, so it was present in both places. This is indicative of systemic rather than intracerebral synthesis of gamma globulins. I love that they wrote this. The results should be interpreted in conjunction with all these tests, right? So what this is meaning is that this is, not this is not a positive oligoclonal banding report. This is actually a negative one. This just tells us that this patient has an inflammatory process and some of those antibodies that, was, that were kind of abundant in the plasma are leaking into the CSF. So not necessarily nothing to worry about, but not brain only turf, okay? So what about other tests that we send uh, spinal fluid for? We certainly send for microbiology. So in the case um, of, of microbiology, a lot of these processes are brisk, right? These are fast processes. Um, and so you're going to send a lot of tests, but you really don't want to wait for results to treat if you have a high degree of clinical suspicion. So they're kind of Two main, way, two main bugs that we worry about generally, bacteria and virus. In the case of bacteria, we send a gram stain because that allows us to grab all, all bugs that we can see, and India ink for crypto, and then we culture in order to capture everything. In terms of viruses, we can send a viral uh, PCR panel. We can also send for individual viral PCRs if we have a high degree of suspicion for a particular virus like JC virus, Toxo, Lyme, or EBV. Um, there's also a New York State encephalitis panel. So um, not every patient needs every test, of course, because sometimes it just makes no sense at all. Do we really think that the patient has crypto? May, it depends on the patient. If you don't think that they have crypto, you probably don't need to send an India Inc., although it is fun to send an old school test. Okay, so I'm reminding you of what you've probably learned before, but just... Whenever I'm talking about CSF testing and possible infections, I have to remind you of like your work order of operations. So if somebody has suspicious symptoms or signs, you're going to see them, you're gonna see this, and then you're gonna be immediately begin dexamethasone first and then meningitis coverage second, okay? You do all of these things before you do the lumbar puncture, okay? So the time between you have a patient that has suspicious symptoms and signs, and the time that you have lumbar punctured them, you've collected spinal fluid, is probably about an hour, okay? Um, I think if you've seen bacterial meningitis, you know what it looks like and it's not good. Um, and you know right away, this is a patient who needs all of my time and all of my effort, right? Because they're very, very ill. Um, once you've gotten your lumbar puncture, you can be a little bit calmer because you've already started broad coverage. You've already given them dexamethasone and now you can watch and see how things are working, your empiric coverage is working. Over the next one to three days, you're gonna be receiving results and you're gonna be tapering and adjusting your meningitis coverage, right? Okay, why does this matter um, at a cancer hospital? Um, because infection is always a possibility for our patients. Our patients are immune compromised. This slide used to be like not as obvious, um, but now I feel that with COVID, <laughs> we are reminded every day about how immune compromised um, all of our patients are. Anyway, so the thing about infection is that for neurologic patients, their pre existing focal deficits might actually get worse with infection. So a patient may be well compensated and will have no 
neurologic symptoms and their infection may make them worse. And so they may present with neurologic complaints and not com present with an infectious complaint. Um, I think that it's important to remember also that um, infection at the very least can contribute to most altered mental status. And very often, I'm sorry to say, you know, we can't always kill the cancer, but we have a fighting chance to kill the bacteria. And so I feel like let's kill those bugs, huh? Um, so for these patients where infection is on your differential diagnosis, um, <laughs> I would just say, think of a good reason not to get CSF urine and blood and send them for culture. It's really hard to think of a good reason. Once you see the patient and you're worried, it's sort of too late. I think that if you even think once about herpes, you should be starting a cyclovir and get CSF. Um, I don't, in my experience, you never regret broad coverage at the onset. Um, HSV encephalitis is an awful thing. And once uh, the damage has occurred in the brain, it's terrifically difficult to get ahead of. Um, you will not regret it. Your attending will not regret it. Even when the creatinine starts to go up, everyone is gonna feel like, well, at least we protected them from HSV, right? So um, in terms of how infections present in, CN, uh, in cancer patients, or at least CNS infections in cancer patients, you need to sort of prepare your mind and kind of adjust your antennae for um, a non-classic presentation, okay? So um, patients who have cancer will complain of headache, um, fever, they may have personality changes or delirium and may have seizures. Uncom they was very uncommon for these patients to have nuchal rigidity, rigidity, pardon me, or a focal uh, neurologic deficit, okay? So those are classic signs and symptoms that you might expect in a non-cancer patient. Um, but with cancer and the patient who's probably already getting a lot of dexamethasone and may have an impaired inflammatory response, they may just have kind of a headache and look a little dopey. And it's not wrong for you to have a CNS infection on your differential diagnosis. So this is sort of uh, my favorite list of CNS infections um, and kind of infection and then their classic treatment. Some of these treatments, um, this is sort of kind of shooting from the hip, treating, um, getting listeria coverage with ampicillin. Of course, you're gonna be talking to ID, but if you have this list memorized and then you're talking to ID and you say things like, I'm concerned about Toxo, should we add sulfadiazine? They're gonna think you're extremely clever. And even if they say, no, you know what? I think we should give something else. You earn points, you earn points. It's important because you're gonna be asking them for coverage later, so you may as well. Okay, so getting to the heart of the matter, which is in my case, leptomeningeal metastasis. And part of what we're looking for in a lot of our patients, right? We're looking to identify cancer cells in the spinal fluid. And there are kind of three major ways that we identify um, cancer cells in the spinal fluid. One is by cytology, another is by flow cytometry, and another one is by circulating tumor cells. And these I have divided into old school, disco, and new school. Why? Because I'm silly, but seriously, cytology is really old school. This is something that is a technique that was invented earlier than 1920s, but came into common practice in the 20s, okay? Any hospital can do it. Low sensitivity, reasonable specificity, and you can identify cancer versus non-cancer, right? And this is what um, CSF cytology looks like. You can see the cancer cells splatted against the, uh, the slide there. You can tell it's cancer because they have these big, ugly looking nuclei. It's great. So cytology is fabulous, but as we all know, it's not super sensitive, right? And it doesn't really tell us so much about what kind of cancer we have. We get more information when we do flow cytometry. This is technology that was um, first invented in the late 60s and really came into clinical practice in the 70s and the 80s. Most hospitals can do it, and it's really based on the surface markers on a cell. It's super sensitive, but you really need to know what you're looking for. You need to know what kind of blood cancer do I care about? What kind of cancer do I care about? Because you need to put the right antibodies on the cells to identify those surface markers, okay? This is what uh, flow cytometry looks like. Um, and you can see here the clusters of cells in space. So there's um, various different ways that you can carry out flow cytometry. But in this case, this is just a, a smear and you can see all these different kinds of cells. The newest technology 
um, are is circulating tumor cells. And this is pretty new school. This is um, something that happened kind of the late 2010s. Um, most cancer sensors can now do it. It's based on surface markers and it's very, very sensitive, but it only works for some cancers because it's based on those surface markers. So the surface markers we're talking about at Sloan Kettering are um, EPCAM, and this is a, a, a marker that exists only on, um, on epithelial cancers, so breast and lung cancer. Um, we're working to expand this technology for things like melanoma and other tumors, but we don't really have that technology working. So it doesn't really work for everything. In the case of melanoma, I'm back here working with a cytology. Bummer, right? What's nice about uh, circulating tumor cells is it can tell us the number of cancer cells. And so then we're able to titrate and kind of say like, oh, it must be getting better. The number of tumor cells are going down. The downside, as we also know, is that uh, circulating tumor cell technology is a little bit finicky. And for example, right now, our instrument is down. I don't have these numbers for my patients. The patients are all really into these numbers and they want to know how things are going. And it sort of breaks my heart to tell them like, well, the instrument is not currently working. Okay. So why do I care so much about diagnosing leptomeningeal metastasis? It's because leptomeningeal metastasis can present with almost any number of symptoms, right? Um, so one of my, my teachers used to refer to leptomeningeal metastasis as the Willie Nelson diagnosis, um, because it should always be on your mind, right? It can elicit high pressure headaches, neuropathies, upper and motor neuron pattern weakness, radicular symptoms, CODAS and CAUDA syndromes, nausea, pressure waves, basically almost any neurologic symptom a cancer patient has, it could be lepto, which I don't say to be self-serving or to be dark, but it could be lepto, right? So you just kind of want to keep that on your differential. Think of Willie Nelson and how, you know, you're always on his mind. Well, lepto is always on my mind, okay? So how do we diagnose leptomeningeal metastasis? We diagnose it through a combination of, of imaging and CSF examination. And so that constitutes complete staging, right? So here is what leptomeningeal metastasis looks like on an MRI scan. You can see these sort of serpiginous enhancing uh, lesions. You can see um, enhancement just underneath the ependymal layer and the ventricles. You can see coating of the brain stem sitting here between the cerebellar folia, some sort of nodular enhancement on the cranial nerves. Um, and you can see enhancing, enhancing lesions throughout the spine, okay? And we already talked about CSF cytology. The reason that cytology matters is because um, positive cytology is a definitive diagnosis. So this is a very old fashioned um, paper, right? You can tell because it didn't even reproduce well. And it's from 1982 from my, uh, from my teacher, Jerome Posner. Um, and what he famously found was that, look, the only way to rule out definitively leptomeningeal metastasis is to have a totally normal CSF in every respect, normal pressure, normal cells, normal protein, normal glucose. In that case, if you have normal everything else and the cytology is negative, you can rule out lepto, right? Otherwise, if you have something that's a little bit abnormal, then you need to chase it. And you need to chase it on a subsequent uh, lumbar puncture up to three lumbar punctures. So this is not a way to live, right? You cannot keep tapping patients. They start to give up, they get grouchy, I know. So the circulating tumor cells um, technology was huge for us. Um, and so this is an example of one of my patients with her serial um, circulating tumor cell counts. You can see here, this is before diagnosis. Here we are after diagnosis, 183. After treatment, this was, uh, she got some proton CSI and you can see it's coming back. CSF count went up to 16. At 200, she agreed to finally start taking uh, a uh, a PARP inhibitor, the PARP inhibitor, now we went back down to four and eventually to zero, okay? So this circulating tumor cell assay is really amazing and really allows us to be able to detect our treatment or kind of tailor our treatment according to what's happening with the patient before they have symptoms because um, the spoiler alert on this one is that this patient has had no uh, neurologic symptoms throughout this entire course. Huh. 
So if I was waiting for her to develop a symptom, um, I would be waiting a while. So the, the final test that I wanna to talk to you about um, that we do here at Sloan that's a little bit boutique-ish um, is, um, is looking at the, the cell-free DNA in the spinal fluid. And the reason that we do this um, in the spinal fluid particularly is because metastasis is really an evolutionary problem. So we have a, a primary tumor that is going to invade and disseminate it's meaning it's going to metastasize to various sites over time, right? Here's the first set of metastasis. Then we're applying some selective pressure in the form of therapy. Then we're going to have another metastasis come out, more selective pressure. We have the environmental selective pressure of metastasis to a weird site like the brain. And we have these metastases that are different than the primary tumor. So how can we tailor our therapy to a central nervous system metastasis um, if we're looking back at a, at a primary tumor that no longer exists, right, that has changed so much. So we know that this is true um, through a many, many sequencing studies. Many of them came from here at Sloan. Um, and we also know that we're able to detect these changes um, in metastases, both in the brain and the lung and other sites. So the problem, of course, is that to carry out um, some of that work, we needed to resect um, tissue. We needed to take these patients to the OR. The problem, of course, particularly in the central nervous system, is that not all of our lesions are equally accessible, right? We're really collecting one metastasis at a time. These are really invasive procedures, and then the patients are going to need to recover before you can give them their next treatment. So each procedure is adding potential uh, morbidity to the patient's overall experience a cancer, right? This is why we have this new approach of liquid biopsy because there's no need for surgery. It gives us a read of all metastases in that particular site. And there's really no delay in treatment, right? So we don't have to wait for the patient to recover in order to start treatment. You can collect the serial, you know, the liquid biopsy, get your results and then start treatment immediately. It also facilitates serial biopsies so that we can follow a patient's um, disease at the level of DNA over time. Um, importantly, I'm supposed to remind you of this, the pathologist will thank me, this is not a replacement for a pathologic diagnosis. We need tissue in order to make a pathologic diagnosis, but once we have one, we can kind of pivot over into liquid biopsy land. So when people are saying liquid biopsy, what they're really meaning is and analyzing a biological fluid to gain knowledge of a cancer's stage or its molecular composition, okay? Um, and so this is a, a cartoon that I, I drew to kind of describing this from spinal fluid. So if we think about um, spinal fluid um, from our patients, we see circulating tumor cells and cell-free DNA. The circulating tumor cells, I already talked to you about. We can also take these cells and we can, we can sequence them. But the cell-free DNA here, this is what we're using to be able to sequence and to understand the tumor um, here at Sloan. The cell-free DNA technology is much more sensitive than sequencing the tumors. So you might think that collecting these cells and sequencing them would give you better data, but it turns out the cell-free DNA does a better job of things. That's what we um, showed here. This is work that was headed up by Elena Pensova in 2016. Um, but also reflects some work that was done previously um, at our institution by others. So this is what a CSF impact report looks like. Um, here's this patient. Um, we sent her spinal fluid. Marcel collected the CSF. Thanks, Marcel. Um, and you can see all of the mutation analysis for this patient. So she has a P53 mutation. Um, we can see um, a DMT3B um, mutation. We can also see some structural variants here in the spinal fluid. What's really cool is that these are very different than the mutations that we found originally in her first, in her primary tumor. So in the few seconds that I have left, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about intrathecal treatment, um, because I know that um, many of you deliver intrathecal treatment. And if you don't, you should, it's good, clean, fun. And it's, um, it's something that is, is very useful in uh, neuro-oncology. So there are two different ways that we can deliver intrathecal therapies. We can deliver intrathecal therapy by omaya or by uh, lumbar puncture. 
okay? So um, for both of these routes of delivery, we need to have good spinal fluid flow. And if you're all in doubt, you need to establish that with a dedicated study, okay? So that's a, a flow study. Um, the Maya port is great because um, you get really great circulation of your, of your drug. The downside is that you gotta take your patients to the OR um, to have it placed, but it's a pretty low key procedure. Lumbar puncture is great because you don't need to take them to the OR, but the treatment circulates imperfectly throughout the nervous system. And the rate of infiltration outside the spinal fluid is up to 10%. So if we're talking about cytotoxic chemotherapy um, infiltrating the skin and these other tissues back here, um, we could potentially have a problem, right? So what can we put in there, right? What's the juice that we can put in? There are um, a few of our favorites, right? Methotrexate, cytarabine, biotipa, topotecan, um, also toposide, um, busulfan, mefalan, and um, retux. I didn't even put rituximab on here, which is the thing that you guys probably know the best. For all of these, you want to measure um, your pressure after accessing the space if you're doing a lumbar puncture. If you're in an omaya, you don't have to do that. You're going to remove an equal volume of CSF, you know, a volume equal to your drug, plus rinse. You can even get a little extra out if you want. You're going to instill your um, drug in slowly and mix as you go. Um, and then you're going to rinse out the system with your reserve spinal fluid. The risks of intrathecal treatment are chemical meningitis, um, infection, and transient increased um, elevated pressure. This is why um, I underline slowly here. You're never in a rush to give intrathecal therapy. Have a conversation with the patient. I don't know. I tell jokes. What are the complications? We talked a little bit about this, but um, headache, diplopia, nausea, fever, and neck pain are all possible symptoms that a patient might complain of. Um, and this may reflect um, uh, meningitis. Uh, the meningitis that they're getting may be a, a chemical meningitis or uh, a bacterial meningitis or infectious meningitis. So because we are concerned so much, we treat empirically with dexamethasone and we treat for infectious meningitis. Um, and then we wait for our cultures to come back positive, and then we um, treat for, we commit to a full course for infectious meningitis. And if it's a chemical meningitis, we remove our, um, our empiric coverage. All right, so that, oh, I still, I think I did well. We have a little bit of time left. So I'm gonna stop share so we can take questions. Oh, how do I, I need to stop. Sorry, I'm like an old person trying to figure out how to use my mouse.